Hey everyone, my name is Ashton Gleckman and welcome to the 2018 finale of Behind the Score. In today's episode, we're going to be exploring Alan Silvestri's iconic score for the Polar Express. And we're going to be taking a look at the various themes, the harmony, the orchestration, as well as the elements of the score. And I've arranged a piece of music based off of Alan Silvestri's original Polar Express suite, which includes the main theme, the Polar Express main theme song, When Christmas Comes to Town, the section involving the spirit of the season, which includes one theme and two interludes, as well as the reprise of the main theme. If you guys are interested, you can find the Cubase session MIDI file and stems for this specific episode down below. And as my thank you to you guys, I've also arranged a huge collection full of all of 2018's BTS packs. Thank you guys so much for joining me, not only in this episode, but also 2018 in general. Plenty of really fun stuff planned for 2019, so keep your eyes open for that. But without further ado, here's the Polar Express suite. Well, you coming? Where? Why, to the North Pole, of course! This is the Polar Express!
So this film was directed by Robert Zemeckis, who also directed the Back to the Future series. He directed Castaway, Forrest Gump, directed Ally, The Walk, as well as the 2009 Christmas Carol film, which was another sort of motion capture film in the same sort of style of The Polar Express and Beowulf, which followed in 2007. Uh, which Robert Zemeckis also directed and Alan wrote the score for. But this film was made in 2004 when you know technology was at a very early stage in terms of motion capture. So it was very innovative in terms of a technological sort of level. And then you have sort of Alan's score and you have the voice performances by Tom Hanks and the whole entire story, which was based on the original Chris Von Allsburg book. And it all came together to create what is now just a great holiday classic. And this film still shows in IMAX at a theater nearby where I live every single December. And it came out in 2004, so that just shows how sort of timeless and how big of a journey it's had. And it's that you know movie where you can turn it on uh, during December uh, with a cup of hot chocolate with your kids and your family and just enjoy it. Because it really is so uplifting and fun and it has that sort of Christmas spirit vibe to it. And the music is such a great, strong part of it. Um, not only Alan's score, but the, the songs that were created. It's got such a great, rich musical aesthetic. Now, the Polar Express is based on the original book by Chris von Allsburg, and it follows the story of a young boy who's awoken during the middle of the night on Christmas Eve to a mysterious train outside of his house. And he boards the train, and here we have this big journey to the North Pole and back. And it's this great fun adventure full of these great classic animated set pieces full of energy and adventure. And for me, that's all the things that I love about classic animated movies, whether it's Up or whether it's new things like Coco. It's the certain sense that animation has to just bring about this amazing sense of energy. Now, The Polar Express is a very interesting and unique musical landscape because the songs written by Alan Silvestri and Glenn Ballard were one of the first things to even be done in the film because the animators needed the songs to animate too. So, you know, the songs were written and then once production was over and Alan was brought in to do the score for the film, he was given the task to write around 30 minutes of underscore based on the original melodic ideas from those songs. So one of the main themes that he used in the underscore was from Believe with Josh Groban and that became the main Polar Express theme. But then we also have things like the Spirit of the Season, um, and then there was only one main theme that he used in the film that wasn't in the songs, which is the seeing is believing theme. And that specific theme is used during various sort of mysterious moments in the film. So now we're back for the elements of the score portion, and I just want to take a look at the different songs that were written, as well as the sort of themes that he introduces within the songs, and also, of course, the compositional tools that he uses throughout the film that really make the score interesting and unique. Now, the first song I want to touch on is Believe, which is sung by Josh Groban. It has a certain sort of flow and aesthetic presence. It's super smooth, the voice is incredible, and it has this melodic structure that is surrounded with rising intervals. So it has that rising fifth, and then the minor sixth, and it's constantly just rising and rising and rising. Now, not only are the intervals rising, but also the harmony is rising. There's this very distinct sort of semitone chord move that happens throughout the piece um, that really captures Polar Express in just a couple of chords. Believe in what your heart is saying. Hear the melody that's playing. There's no time to waste. Then the next two are what I would call fun, hyperactive ensemble pieces, and these would be the Polar Express and Hot Chocolate. In terms of thematic material that he's using in the underscore, he certainly uses more of Polar Express. He uses this certain horn fragment all throughout the film, um, specifically from the Polar Express, which has a certain Back to the Future vibe to it. And both of these pieces have this really, really noticeable upbeat to them, and the orchestration is very sort of agile and constantly moving. In terms of my personal favorite pieces in the whole film, probably it's When Christmas Comes to Town. It's a duet and it's just incredibly well written. It has this certain very emotional, yet subdued, quiet, yet powerful um, vibe to it. And specifically the bridge of this song I think is really, really well done. Um, I think it's in F and the bridge would be taking place in D flat major. Um, so that specific jump just sounds super, super uplifting and the way that it flows back into the verse. I think um, really makes for a great song. And all the dreams of children Once lost will all be found That's all I want when Christmas comes to town The final one is Spirit of the Season, which is a large part of the original suite. And this is what you would call your classic um, Christmas hum. It just has a big, huge grandeur to it, 
big choral presence, huge orchestration. And I think that this song is just a great example of Christmas. It just has the feeling of snow falling, the whole entire vibe of the third act of the film. Um, it's very sort of um, comparative to things like A Christmas Carol uh, 2009, all these big orchestral pieces that Silvestri writes, including the ending credits piece. And not only the songs, but the score is a great example of Silvestri's incredible skill in taking these small ideas and transforming them into these big textures. And he's able to create so many rich variations throughout it and really develop it. Now actually on the original album release in 2004, there was only the suite from the Polar Express. And then for the uh, For Your Consideration version of the album, which was sent to the Academy, uh, people were able to listen to other cues of the film. Now the first two cues I want to talk about are Flat Top Tunnel and On the Ice. And here you can really see Silvestri's unique action writing in its full sort of glory. If you go back to Predator, Predator 2, if you go back to uh, Back to the Future, or even the previous year before Polar Express, Van Helsing, you can hear his certain style in terms of action writing. But the next two cues are full of lots of wonder, lots of sort of room, lots of space. Um, they're fairly small and delicate in terms of the orchestration. That is uh, Meeting Santa Claus and The Ride Home. Now these mainly use the Believe theme, and they're, like I said, they're very small, very intimate. One thing about trains, it doesn't matter where they're going. What matters is deciding to get on. The next piece has the Sing is Believing theme, which actually isn't from the original songs. It's the only one that isn't. And it has this sense of otherworldly wonder to it. And it's very sort of mysterious. It's played on a Celeste, I believe. And I was interested to know who actually played the Celeste on the score because I couldn't find it in the credits. But to me, it sounded like Randy Kerber who did the original, um, I believe it was Harry Potter. And then he's done countless scores since, even leading up to Pirates of the Caribbean 5, where he did the dual Celeste thing that Jeff Zanelli did. Now I want to mention two names that are incredibly iconic in regards to film scoring, and that is Conrad Pope and William Ross. Now they have both worked on an indescribably immense amount of different films. They've both worked with an incredible amount of directors and have a ridiculous amount of experience in the industry. And they both have just such a great skill and a great history, and they both worked on this film. Now the music editor is a not so talked about, but extremely important vital role in any film production because they do have a ton on their plate. They're dealing with heavy collaborations with the composer. They're taking things and putting it over this and seeing how that works. And they have all these individual tasks that make their jobs actually quite difficult in the process of a film, especially looking at someone like Alex Gibson, who are dealing with these huge Hans Zimmer scores. But on this film, Kenneth Carman was the music editor, and he's worked with Alan for a very, very long time prior to this film. And this must have been an interesting film to be a music editor on, seeing how different thematic material worked all over the place for this film individually, because the songs and everything it must have been an interesting position to be in. So let's talk about some of the techniques that Alan Sylvester used in creating the score. And the first notable one is probably the orchestration setup. Uh, it's a massive orchestra. You have strings, winds, choir, um, brass. You have bells, um, so like chimes, tubular bells. You have harp. You have all of these different elements that sort of go together to create this sort of big, huge um, ensemble sound. One of the things that I love about the score is the sort of use of the choir. So many times in scores you'd have sort of SATB, and there is quite a bit of that in the score, but one of the things that I love how he treats the choir is he uses it as sort of like an exclamation mark on certain, you know, in certain parts. The score is full of huge, huge, rich, sort of big octave string melodies, um, great melodies in the brass, like French horns. And what he does is he'll just throw on a choir in octaves, you know, female in the upper octave, men in the lower octave, and it just adds this huge, really, really exciting, rich, energetic feel to the, to the melody. The next thing is the use of variation and sonic development. So since the score is 30 minutes long and around 25 of those minutes is material from the songs, it really needs a lot of variation, keeping things interesting by using it in different sort of instrumentation. So he'll take one theme that uh, maybe was in the Polar Express in very sort of energetic and happy, and he'll use it in an action cue, which he does multiple times. Um, or he'll take something that is very, very big and make it very small in instrumentation. Um, so the amount of versatility in the, uh, and variety in the content that he introduces is, is pretty incredible. Um, and I think it's another great example of why Silvestri is so great is because he's able to take this content and use it in so many different ways. The next thing is that this is a very agile score, meaning that there's lots of gears in motion. Um, so there's very fast moving lines, there's tempos that can go from here to here, there is lots of string runs and woodwind runs and 
um, interesting flourishes in the percussion. You have um, lots of different things going on at a pretty rapid pace, um, especially during the action cues and um, the more upbeat moments of the songs. But it really constantly keeps you engaged. And one of the things that Thomas Newman has said in regards to animation, things are you know constantly in motion and you might have to change from one texture to another texture in 10 seconds or 15 seconds. Um, and this film has a whole lot of that. So the next thing is the use of layering. Now usually when we're talking about layering on this channel, we're referring to things like you know layering sample libraries. But in regards to orchestration, it's almost like if you have a color palette and you have green and red and blue, and you combine two colors, you create new colors. And composers like Alan Silvestri and John Williams do this with the orchestra. So combining the flute with the violin, or the oboe with the violin, or the bassoon and the cello, or the French horn and the cello. You can create so many cool, new, interesting textures by combining these things. And he does this all throughout the score and all throughout many of his scores. And that's just another example of the genius orchestration of the film. So there is the elements of the score. So let's go ahead and begin our sweet analysis. So we start out with the main theme. We go into the Polar Express song. We go into When Christmas Comes to Town. And then we go into a section that sort of divides the uh, song Spirit of the Season into multiple different parts. So we start out with the main theme that's presented. We have two different interludes and two different variations of that initial theme involving content from the interludes. And then it heads into a sort of like break section and then we head back into a, a reprise of the main theme. So that's sort of the structure of the piece. So we're just gonna go ahead and take it section by section. So let's start out with bar one um, through 20. So in terms of harmony, we're starting out on G major, and then we have a B minor, second inversion, A minor, G flat major, uh, first inversion, A minor, so we have like a C major 7, then a D major. And the first thing you'll probably notice is the choirs, which are split up into octaves. So we have the female choirs on the upper octave, men's choir on the lower octave, which sounds like this together. We're doubling that with a children's choir. And those are doubling the mainstream melody. And the brass is really what gets most of the harmony here. Uh, most of the harmony is actually in the horns. And then we have this sort of lower brass really creating a lot of the weight. You can see that we have a sort of counter melody here in the horns. Which really just adds a whole lot to the texture because when you remove the counter melody, it's not like it necessarily sounds bad, it just doesn't sound sort of as full. And the counter melody is interesting because, you know, the listener isn't going to be paying attention specifically to the counter melody, but it does add something to the texture and um, creates a certain sense of weight. For the woodwinds, we have flute one, flute two, first oboe, and second clarinet on the melody. And then everything else sort of just accompanies that. So we have clarinet one, bass clarinets, and then the two bassoons. In regards to percussion, we just sort of have a cymbal and timpani roll, and then a piatti hit. And the percussion generally throughout the suite is relatively simple because we're sticking to traditional percussion elements like timpani, like uh, cymbals. But then we also incorporate, you know, sleigh bells. We have a tambourine, um, also like a triangle and glockenspiel, which really does help highlight melodies really, really well. Um, and we use that in a couple of the sections in the suite, but that's what's happening in the percussion. And then in regards to the strings, other than this sort of main melody, which is the strings playing in octaves, we really just have the sort of mid to low string section creating movement within the texture. You can see that the strings on their own aren't very rich, but when you combine them with the brass, this 
where you start to get most of the weight. And then we also have this Celeste, which is just sort of sitting below the mix. It's going to be one of those things that you don't necessarily notice from first glance, but it does really help to add some sort of sparkle and shimmer to the whole entire mix. And for the lower section, we've just incorporated this sub bass, which just sits below everything else. And um, here is all of that together. It just repeats that and then we go into this next section the polar express song which is split up into two various um, sort of portions the first portion is sort of like the introduction and then we head into the actual song so looking at the introduction let's just listen to the first part <laughs> so this is specifically consisting of a low ostinato So we're starting on D. And then like over here on bar 25, it goes up, a sort of semitone. So on top of that, we have the horns, which just have this major second starting on B flat, and then B, and then C, and then D flat. And the trombones are just sort of sitting below that. snare drum is really creating most of the movement. And then the runs are essentially landing on the next note that the horns are going to. So like on bar 22, so it lands on B and then it would land on C and then it would land on D flat. So now we're on to the big 2D section. So this is really characterized by its really, really strong upbeat. So if we just listen to like the brass on its own, for example, you can see we have various layers. So we have the actual melody. We have, you know, these sort of quarter note hits. And then tuba sitting below that. And then we have the horns on the upbeats. And then we have these little sort of times where the, you know, trumpets will uh, come in. For woodwinds, we have first flute, first oboe, first clarinet, just playing the sort of main melody. And then we have the lower woodwinds, which are really creating um, or helping to create that major sort of upbeat feel. And then all together. In regards to the strings, we have the strings playing in octaves for the melody. And then the pizzicato is really what's bringing a lot of the warmth to the string section. That's sort of being doubled by the spiccato. We also have runs in the strings as well as the woodwinds. You can see they come in at different times and are just sort of there to enhance the color. And then the string runs come in. And then we have a little bit of harp, or a little bit of celeste, which as you can see, it's just coming in during certain moments. Again, you can't really notice it, but it adds a certain shimmer to the overall um, texture. And then if we look at the glockenspiel, you can see that it's just outlining the melody. Bass drum is playing on all the quarter notes. Same thing with the sleigh bells, and the sleigh bells also have a second layer, which is the upbeat. And the tambourines are on the quarter notes. And then we also have a Piatti hit over here in bar 35. And then bar 36 is when we bring in some long elements, which sound like this. And then we have this sort of like final little trumpet um, phrase. So for the harmony, we have F, B flat, 
walk down, which is F, E, D, G, C. And then we have another walk down, and it sort of has the semitone phrase above it. D flat major. So here is that section again. So for when Christmas comes to town, we start out with this little section which just has a pedal note in the upper strings, and then the penny whistle comes in first, followed by an oboe, and then mirrored is the bassoon. Flute comes in one octave above, and is sort of like harmonized by the uh, English horn. And then the first oboe comes back in, and then we also have the bassoon. So going into this section, we have the melody on the upper strings. And helping to create movement in the sort of middle of the string section, we have the cellos. Staccatos on the eighth notes, and then bass longs. So the brass is pretty subtle for the first portion of this specific song, and then we bring in the bass trombones around bar 61. And then the trumpets. We have a bit of movement in the trumpets as well, which sounds like this. The woodwinds are generally just playing accompaniment. None of them are really playing the melody in that full force um, like we do in the strings. Like the flutes, for example, you can see it's pretty subtle and soft. And then everything else is really just for accompaniment. And then we have this big change over here on bar 57, where we have this certain phrase in the woodwinds, which are just essentially major thirds that are being moved up a scale. And then we have these sort of woodwind flutters that come in. For the percussion, we have literally nothing going on other than just some chimes every now and then. And then looking at our choir, that doesn't come in until bar 57 when we get into the bridge. Uh, but we have a children's choir, and then a sort of very, very soft low choir. And then we bring in the woman's choir over here on 61. Then the two elements lying below everything else is the celeste and the harp. And if you were to remove these, you definitely notice a difference, but you don't necessarily notice them on the surface, but one of those things that are just sort of part of the texture. And so here is all of that together. So for this song, the harmony starts out in F. G minor, C with a third of the bass, and that is just really a walk down to D minor, and then B flat, dominant, back to the tonic, and then the bridge goes to D flat major, and then we of course have E flat major, C minor, Sus4, we have this diminished chord that it lands on, and then this big B major chord, which resolves perfectly to this sus chord. And then we're 
we're back to the tonic. So in regards to the structure of Spirit of the Season, we have the initial theme introduced at the beginning here, and then we have the chorus for the first interlude. We have the first variation of the initial sort of theme, and so he just takes what we had here, and he just increases the expression and sort of mass of the brass and percussion, and also takes a theme from the interlude and just sort of lays it on top. And then going into the second interlude, we have a brand new theme, and then we have a variation from the first interlude. So let's start out by listening to the opening prelude of Spirit of the Season. So for this, we just have G flat, and then A flat, and then on top of that, we have the melody. So for the low strings, we have tremolo. The couple octaves above, we just have the root note. And of course, a string run that sort of transitions not only from the G flat to the A flat, but also to the interlude. And the percussion for this first section of it is fairly empty. Triangles, a bit of chimes, and then we bring in the sleigh bells. So for the brass, we really just have these big sort of low notes, which sound like this on their own. And then we of course have the melody being played in the French horns. Then over here in 68, to create some movement in the brass section, we have this sort of fanfarish trumpet. And then also the melody coming in a couple octaves above the French horns with the trumpets. For the woodwinds, we barely have anything going on other than a simple bassoon, and then the woodwind runs. And of course, those woodwind runs are working directly with the string runs. And also we have a harp gliss, which sound like this together. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the first interlude. So we're starting on A flat major. We have a walk up and then a walk down. Dominant tonic. So it really just repeats that. And then we have this section where it goes C7, B flat, E flat, a flat and then D flat. So for this piece we have the strings which are creating a lot of the warmth for this specific texture. The main melody is being played by these string octaves. And then the cello comes in here on bar 72 which is being doubled by the French horns and that sounds like this. We of course have the accompaniment for the strings. And then the brass is really there just to create a sort of wider sound. We actually don't have anything in the woodwind section doubling the melody, it's really just all accompaniment. So you can see what Alan Silvestri is actually doing in this specific portion of the suite is he's trying out theme and variation. So he introduces the theme here, he introduces, for example, this flute element, which he then brings into another variation of that initial theme. So he's trying out different things um, in sort of different orchestration environments, which is one of the things we talked about in the elements of the score section, which is the importance of being able to take one idea and put it into different environments. Um, so that's what we have going on in the woodwinds. So the bassoons here play a pretty important role in helping to create a lot of this warmth and it's doubled by the clarinets, which are extremely sort of smooth sounding instruments. And then of course we have that flute note that's just sitting above the orchestra. And then these tiny little flute flutters coming in between. So the percussion is super, super simple. We just have a sleigh bell on the eighth notes. Tambourine as well. And we've taken out the sleigh bell that actually functions as the quarter note. And we save that for when the variation, um, the first variation comes back in. And we also have these little sort of triangle hits, as well as the glockenspiel. 
which is create a nice little shimmer. So for this specific sort of transition, we have a A flat major chord, first inversion, which just walks up to a root A flat major chord. And that is in the strings, as well as in the woodwinds. And it's being doubled by a timpani um, roll, a cymbal roll, as well as a woodwind or a string run. All together. For the first variation, it's essentially just the prelude with the interlude theme. Other than that, just the sort of mass and expressiveness of the brass and the percussion section um, has sort of increased. And we also have this little timpani, which is doubling what the choirs are doing. So the harmony for the interlude is E flat major, sus2, B flat major with the uh, third of the bass, then we have C, F, B flat, E flat major, D, G, C, and then F. You can see we have the main melody and the violins, and then he's using all these other voices to sort of interweaving in and out of it. Cello. Cello first to VC. And then the contrabass. So you can see all these individual voices that are doing different things sort of collectively come together to create this harmonic texture. And uh, this sort of style of voice writing is very common in Alan Silvestri's music, as well as John Williams, Ennio Morricone. In regards to the brass, it's very, very minimal. The strings are doing most of the work here. Low brass comes in, horn melody, trumpets. This moment here I absolutely love because of course we get this big, you know, bass trombone hit and we also have the piatti and then a low sort of um, timpani and bass uh, drum hit. Which ends up creating this very classic Alan Silvestri. The only other thing that we have happening here during the second interlude is, you know, more of these woodwind flutters. So what he's done for the first interlude variation is he's just taken that initial orchestration that we had for the prelude, uh, which sounds like this. Or like this. And he's just put that, um, that interlude inside of that environment, which sounds like this. So you can see we have the exact same flute thing that was going on over here. It's almost like a big, uh, you know, big musical Legos. He's taking one element from here, from this variation, putting it inside another variation with a different theme. Um, it's just a really, really great way, especially because this is a suite of conceptualizing ideas, but most importantly, conceptualizing how ideas can develop and become something different. Um, so there's that going on, as well as these sort of woodwind flutter runs. And then woodwind sort of creating a motor. And then comparative to before, you can see that we have much more presence in the lower woodwinds. And then of course the brass right here is just really in full force. The 
percussion is the exact same as it was in the uh, sort of previous uh, first variation as well as that initial prelude. In regards to the strings, they're doing exactly what they were doing on the first interlude, just a bit more powerful and expressive. And then of course we have these strings which are being doubled by the brass shorts. trumpets have the melody and then we of course have this sort of E minor to F major thing and so for this big transition here what he's done is he's just taken low percussion so that would include timpani also taken cymbals as well as chimes and he's just doubled that with these string runs which end up sounding like this so here on bar 91 we sort of have this big break which which has this phrase, which modulates to B major. You can see all that we actually have is this pedal tone and the strings, and then these low hits, which consist of piano hits, as well as cymbal hits and low percussion. So now we're going into the reprise of the main theme, and it's first played in B major, and then it goes up a half step to the key of C major. And the tessitura, or how hard um, the players are actually trying to play, is going to get a bit more tense, especially for the singing. Um, so here is that portion. <laughs> here we just have choirs moving up various inversions of F major and then I've sort of added in my little flare and gone to an F minor chord and of course it also has that D in there which really just calls for C major but anyways there is the sweet breakdown So there is Behind the Score of the Polar Express, and with that being said, the final video of 2018. I can't believe it's been a year already, and it's been a really, really fun year. Um, I think we've done like 13 scores, and I just saw that we've crossed over 26 hours of collective Behind the Score episodes. And I really would not still be doing this if it wasn't for you guys continuing to come back and support the videos. All of your guys' comments and messages and recommendations for future videos, it's all really helped me a lot. And I hope that you guys have enjoyed the year. I know that I have, and there's gonna be a big, huge lineup for 2019 full of new scores, um, new things we're gonna be doing, so do keep your eyes open for that. Do remember you guys can download the big 2018 collection for Behind the Score down below, which includes all the project files, mini files, and stems for all year's episodes. But with that being said, I hope you guys have a fantastic and relaxing holiday season. I'll be seeing you guys again in 2019. See you later.